What's happening, everybody, and welcome back to Park Lane Podcast, episode number 79, where Spurs are back in the top four. What a time to be alive, people. But we're not also, we're not only live, sorry, on Park Lane Podcast, but we are also live on Spurs Kings TV. So shout out to everybody tuning in from there. If you're tuning in on Twitch, if you're tuning in on YouTube, if you're on Spurs Kings TV, wherever you are, get in the comments, get your comments in, let us know where you are, who you are. It's a safe space for everyone to join in and uh, say whatever you like. So um, let's get into it, people, and let's introduce who we've got about with us today because we do have a late joiner who I'm going to make speak first. Callum is here. Callum, how are you doing? I'm all right, mate. How are you guys doing? All good. I'm good, mate. That's a, one hell of a microphone you've got on there. It's crystal clear. Love to hear it. Yeah, it's good. Well, it's better than it janking out as usual, mate. So it's uh, at least a result for once. <laughs> No, no, good to see you, mate. And uh, Big Dave is back in the house. Dave, how are you doing? I'm all good, mate. I'm doing good. Good to be back. Good, mate. It's really good to have you back. And uh, I only call you Big Dave because on our FIFA streams, I don't know if you've ever seen, but uh, Winnie named your player in our squad Big Dave. And uh, yeah, all my mates come... used to call me Big Dave. That's what oh, yeah? I used to be called Big Dave. So must be something in the air, mate. When he pops up with a little header at the back post, you know. Please enjoy him, mate. I haven't had a chance yet. I think, no, no, I think you, usually uh, loan sharks have a big Dave, don't they? They usually send a big Dave round to collect afterwards. Bailiffs. Bailiffs. Yeah. One of the two. One's <laughs> yeah, legal, exactly. one's not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Harry, how are you doing today, mate? Yeah, very good, thank you. Nice to nice to be back and, and talking about wins, so I can't complain. Yeah, definitely, 100%. Um, quickly, before we get into it, we do have to shout out to our channel sponsor, and that is Manscaped. So if you are new or you've never heard of Manscaped before, head over to manscaped.com, check out all of their products. They're a male grooming brand who are huge across the globe, uh, selling products for millions of people. Um, they were lucky. I was lucky enough to have them to send me some stuff over and, um, you know, the intimate shavers and nose hair, nose hair trimmers, etc. They sent me absolutely first class and uh, you never have to worry about, uh, you know, catching you you know what's ever again uh so yeah if you are interested head over to manscape.com and use the code park lane 20 that's park lane 20 for 20 percent off plus free shipping anyway we've got all of that out of the way let's shout out some people in the chat because there's a lot of you there um, i'm just gonna drop out look just to sort my mic out and my head head's out i can barely hear you just give me two seconds all right yeah no problem uh barney has said evening guys Evening, Jay. Big up to the chat. Uh, Jay Bassett has said, evening. He said, uh, my prediction was 3-1, and I got oh, it. Nice. Uh, Coy's what a win. Um, Johnny is in the chat as well. Who else is in the chat today? There's a lot of them talking Winnie. to each other. <laughs> Two seconds. Holly Agambar is in, saying, Daddy Long Legs was the whiz bomber. And uh, Winnie is in the chat, saying, Coy's big up to everybody that's there and uh let us know where you are from right uh oh for some reason callum's also back i'm not sure where (laughs) you went but you're back god knows god knows to be honest mate (laughs) anyway let's get into it and let's start um chatting to begin with about the west ham game because let's not forget there were two games this week and uh you know we need to talk about that one first so easy one or draw against West Ham, away to West Ham. Now, you know, Callum, before the game, if someone gave you a draw, you'd probably take that, right, against West Ham prior to the game? Theoretically, yeah. Um, I would have taken it most other seasons, but because of how dysfunctional we have been, I thought that that was a good chance to prove ourselves. But, yeah, it was a very bugged-out game, to say the least, mate. And seeing the team that was stated is pretty much the same as today apart from what saw coming in for Benton course so you would have hoped with a team of that quality they could have done something against West Ham and to be honest I think I think Moyes summed it up quite well straight after the game where he said everyone knows how Tottenham plays now mm. everyone has sussed it out you sit back you do a load of 
rubbish and then hope hope for the best. Yeah, definitely, mate. And um, Harry, coming to you on that one, actually, you know, the lineup for the West Ham game was, you know, pretty good. You know, we saw a couple of changes. Um, you know, it was Vicario, Poro, Romero, Van der Ven, the Doggy, Basuma, Bentoncourt, Madison, Werner, Son, and Johnson. And, um, you know, we started the game well against West Ham, didn't we? You know, we started well. Five minutes in, we went 1-0 up. We did, and that's obviously, we could get on to the frustrating thing. We started really well, and I think that overall on the pitch, we have the quality to beat West Ham. You only have to look one, look at them defensively this season, the goals they've conceded, the amount in some games, like against Arsenal, for example, and the manner that, that they lose games. But look at Newcastle. You know, the West Ham of last season, even last season in the relegation battle, would have seen that out. Uh, and seen that out and got all three points, but yeah, they, they end up losing it. So defensively, they're vulnerable. I don't think overall in the game we exploited that enough, tested them enough, but it was certainly a good start to the game. Yeah, definitely. And Dave, that's the thing about Spurs, isn't it? Is like at the start of the season we were shouting at our players for not starting fast enough, and now we're starting fast, but we don't seem to be able to like continue at that speed, or we seem to drop off, or or something happens, like. What what is that all about? Because like going back to West Ham, as I said, one 0 up after five minutes, and we could have been three, probably three 0 up by the time that West Ham got their level. I find it really annoying, mate. Um, it actually drives me insane a little bit because we do start fast now. We do we do get get going pretty quickly, but it, it's really weird. It's like we take the handbrake off for the first ten minutes and then put the handbrake back on. So. You know, I, I can't explain it. You know, I said today, it drives me insane. Defensively, we are, we are a mess, and, and callers are always worrying anyway. You know what? You know what I feel about Tottenham and callers. Every time the opposite opposition has a corner, I feel like they're going to score. Yeah, definitely, mate. And we'll, we'll get on to that um, shortly about our defending from corners because, Callum, one of the things I heard uh, actually last weekend, I think it was, when I was um, listening to the radio driving about, and they were saying that. You know, they were talking about basically all the different teams that have set piece coaches, and then they say Spurs don't have like a dedicated set piece coach as such, and that Ange doesn't, you know, believe in it or some nonsense like that, right? Yet when we were running down Antonio Conte, that's the one thing that we definitely had, right? Was that um, set piece coach who had this like ginormous book of all these like set pieces? Surely you'd think that they'd like remember some of them or something, right? Because do you think it's like essential now in modern football to have somebody who's solely a set piece coach? I think it's quite a controversial argument when you think about it because when we had Conte, we had Giovanni Vio, he's now sitting down at Watford. Um, not that it's doing them much good because Watford just can't find their arse out of a plastic bag, let's put it that way. But the the whole point now is having these set piece coaches, they do focus on the actual technique of them the attacking aspects and the defending aspects so I think it's definitely a necessity and there's been two different points this season where Andrew has spoken about who manages set pieces first it was Yedinak at the start of the season now it seems to be Ryan Mason and if I'm not mistaken but neither of them were really taken any set pieces during their career I know Yedinak did a little bit but they're not say specialists so I think we're definitely missing a touch there with it because even Brentford has won Aston Villa has won a lot of top six clubs don't really but you would hope they've got enough in their coaching locker to do it but a lot of the lower clubs around the uh, top 10 and mid table do have them so it does prove that we can do it and like you said to forget all of that quite quickly was astronomical but if you remember the amount of goals that were scored from set pieces was scored by people like Dyer and people like that the big tall huge defenders we had last year I mean Sanchez even got a few last year from set pieces there was Diff Kane as well Kane scored a lot more set piece goals than he did in any other season last year I believe so it does pay off but I don't think we I've seen properly us use a set piece for about six months. Let's put it that way. And they should have remembered it six months ago. So to lose it since then is quite drastic. And we we can't defend set pieces to save our lives as proven. We got it down, but not even by Zuma's head, not even by his shoulder. It came off the upper part of his arse. 
if you see some of the shots. So we literally got asked. That's how bad it is, mate. So we need to do something about it. And we've all said it over the last couple of weeks. We can see too many set pieces and it just doesn't help us at all. We can see too many goals all in, to be honest, not just set pieces. We I mean, what easy. what did I text you earlier, Dave? It was like two two clean sheets in about 21 games, something like that. It's ridiculous. We haven't kept a clean sheet in 15 games at home this year. Do you remember when we had that the fortress at White Hart Lane? Our whole thing was about defending well at home. I understand Angie's system is going to leak goals, but Jesus Christ, we've conceded more goals than I think under Conte this year, or we're getting close to it. Let's put it that way. It's bad. Yeah, but we're scoring a fucking hell of a lot more, mate. Um, and I, that's really all that matters, isn't it? At the end of no, the day, I know, I know but, it's, that sounds ridiculous, but... But if you think about it, that's how Liverpool used to be. They used to outscore more than they uh, conceded. Then they got Van Dijk and it solidified yeah. them. And Klopp's style, I would say, is progressively better at this stage of the game than Ange's because Ange's only had nine months with us or something like that. But I would hope that we do be able to defend better because we can't keep having games where we're having to outscore even lower opposition teams because they're the ones that are always going to not give you the space that you need. And that's the problem we consider too much. You look at, you look at Van der Ven and Romero, you know, in essence, they're better centre half than Sanchez and Dyer. You know, I know we're playing a new system where the fullbacks are inverted and they go forward and, and etc. Um, but we, I don't understand how we leak so many goals. It's like, I get the fullbacks move forward, but then surely there should be a system in place where the fullbacks are in those, that attacking third, they have cover defenders. So it, it, it baffles me sometimes. Some of the chances we give away, and you know, I, last time I was on, I said on the on this show, I said I feel like we've got a hammer in coming. Someone's going to come along and hammer us. And then what happens? Fulham came along and hammer us. Now, I'm nervous because our next four games are what are they? Newcastle, Chelsea, Liverpool, Arsenal, something like that. Yeah, Newcastle, yeah. Arsenal, uh, Chelsea, because the Man City game is still postponed at the moment with no date mm. announced yet. That's what I mean. You're coming to go, you know, and I hate to talk about Arsenal like it, but they're scoring a hell of a lot of goals. They're ripping things apart for fun. Now, uh, yeah, yeah, we can score a lot of goals too, but they're solid at the back. They are absolutely solid. I think they kept clean sheets the last five home games or something like that. And, you know, they, they look solid. So are we going to score more than them in the game? You know, yeah, it's all well and good saying that, you know, we outscore teams. When you come up against these teams that are solid at the back, your city, you know, et cetera, I'm not going to include Liverpool in that because they're leaking goals for fun as well. But are we going to have enough to be able to, to outscore them? Yeah, it's difficult because one, as you, I, I completely agree with you, Dave, because what happens is, and, you know, I wasn't exactly going to talk about this right now, but I'll talk about uh, Nottingham Forest goal today. Because, you know, what happens there, and similar to the goal against Luton, that we conceded as well, where Destiny Doggy is, kept, is caught too high up the pitch, and he just doesn't track back. And, like, it's all good and well to be this cool, like, inverted fullback, you know, whatever you want to call it. But if you're not going to do your job, which is part of it, which is being a fullback and defending, you're screwed. Because at the end of the day, what has to happen then is Bissouma ends up coming in and, like, stepping into his place. And he's just, he's not asked either, in my opinion, about, you know, he doesn't re probably really doesn't want to cover somebody and come in and, and do that, which is not his job. Well, you know, Destiny just gets to, you know, flounce about out of the pitch somewhere. And then neither people are defending. So that's what should happen is that when one player goes forward, somebody else should cut in. But actually, pretty much everyone's bobbing forward. And if you have both fullbacks going forward and only one Basuma sitting back, you can't have, you know, do you know what I mean? Who's going to cover? Both sides, it's just mental. And so something has to happen. I think I said it maybe last week where we talked about one of them going forward at a time. Do you know what I mean? Like rather than both of them always being inverted and always going mm. forward, why doesn't one of them go forward? So let's say Pedro Porro goes forward. What happens then is they all just step across and create a back three. And then therefore you've got a lot more cover when it comes to you know teams on the counter-attack. I don't know what, what to do, but... You are right. Like, I was kind of taking the piss a little bit where I said, you know, if we score more than the other person, then, yeah, we win the game. But as you say, against teams like Arsenal coming up, Liverpool, um, you know, I'm concerned as well. And I, I rarely get concerned over, you know, who we play. And so it's going to be interesting how we kind of deal with that. And we can't just be like, oh, yeah, we'll deal with it in the summer with signings because that might not happen 
either. Um, but quickly, Harry, I want to go back to you and talk about Timo Werner um, because I want to talk about his input um, into the first goal against West Ham. So one of the things that yeah. Andrew Postacoglu said that was that, you know, while everybody else was away on international duty, he was there training hard and getting ready to be able to fit in, basically. And that's what made him decide to put him in. So Johnson went over on the right. Timo Werner came in on the left. And, um, you know, they both combined with a Timo Werner cross. And, um, you know, it was nice to nice to see. But, um, yeah, what did you make of him, you know, overall? Like, we've, we've had lots of conversations about this, but yeah. there's a specific reason I want to talk about it. I think he's had an instant impact. Honestly, if, if we're basing it off since he's come in in January, for me, he's been one of our best players. Up there with probably Brendan Johnson, and people don't like to say it in terms of January this year, in terms of instant impact in the team, coming in, you know, maybe not always getting the goals, but the assists. Obviously, he's seen a couple of goals to his name as well now. The West Ham, very, very key, causes defenders problems. And, you know, we, we're seeing, like, there's a stat to, to today. Again, we get on to it at Forest. Uh, game now, we, we, we force the most own goals out of anyone in the league. I think it's five now. That has come, all majority of them, if not all, since Timo Werner's come to the club. When he puts the cross in, it makes people panic. So Werner causes problems. And for me, his experience, his versatility, even as an option off, off the bench, for me, it's an absolute no-brainer uh, in the summer. And I, I think a chance that, that not many teams have turned down. Even if, Of course, you know, I think there is better out there. But for me, Werner, even as an option to come for the bench to impact a game, when you need a goal, you defenders are tiring. Like we've seen examples of it. You know, let's use Sheffield United at the start of the season. We could have got the job done earlier with someone like Werner coming off the bench, you know, tiring at the Sheffield United. Because that's played again, then maybe Sheffield United hold on, for example. So a player like Werner, for me, is very, very key. I think he's been very good. Can he be better with shooting and taking these chances at one-on-one with the goalkeeper? Absolutely. I think that could be worked on. He could work with Son, for me, which is, you know, apart from Harry Kane, the best one-on-one -on -one finisher at the moment uh, that you'll find in, in the Premier League, you know, even maybe even Europe. I, I will go that far to say that. Um, so Werner, for me, has impressed me since he's come to Spurs. And I just don't get the, the hate or hesitation around him. I really don't. Yeah, so and I'll come, kind of come around and, and speak about this because uh, it was basically uh, the reason why I asked Harry is because I put a tweet out quite... Um, Absolute rubbish. After, yeah, <laughs> after the West Ham game, <laughs> where I basically said that I've come to the decision now where I'm not... You know, I think that we, there's no need for us to keep Timo Werner. I think that he offers a lot. I think he offers a nice amount of pace. He's good on the ball. But there's that part of his game that I don't like, which is his um, unwillingness to gamble at the far post, his unwillingness to gamble in the box and try and get stuck in. Pulls out 50-50s quite a lot. And um, again, as you mentioned about his finishing, I just think, yes, 15 million quid is a, is a low amount of money or whatever exact figure it is. But for me... Like, if we have aspirations, you know, everybody on social media is saying, we need to be winning trophies. You can't just be happy with a new stadium. You can't just be happy with this, right? So I'm now trying to buy into that and saying, okay, well, if we need that, we need top quality players that can win us things and that can step in and, and make the most out of a situation. I think Timo Werner is a good player. I think that he's a versatile player that can play well as a substitute, sometimes as starting a game like he did today but he's not a player that's going to win us anything. And that's just the bottom line. Um, so I kind of wanted to know, Dave, to come to you first, what your thoughts are on that and Timo Werner in general. I, I do think he's been very good, actually, since he's been at the club. But I'm in the same camp as you, Luke. And I, I, you know, I don't... 15 million quid is uh, there's not a lot of money. Um, but in my opinion, if you do want to go to that next level, you do want to progress, you know, you... You keep the Werner money, you keep the wages, and you invest it in someone better like Alexander Isak, for example, or, or someone along, or, along those sort of lines who can do the same sort of thing as Werner, mm. but he's more clinical in front of goal. You know, I think you know Werner's provided a lot in terms of today. I thought he was excellent. You know, he's, he's, he's getting in, getting in, whipping them balls across. It was great. I, I do feel a bit sorry for him though because he's not Harry Kane, and yeah. I think when the, the next striker to come in after Kane left was always going to be the the stopgap if that makes sense. And I think that that's pretty much what Werner is. He's a stopgap player. He'll come in, he'll do a job until the end of the season. Realistically, we've got players that can do the job that he does. We've got Brennan Johnson that can do the same sort of thing. You know, in my opinion, you, you keep that Werner money. You keep the money you, you spend on wages and the 15 million quid. You reinvest that. You go out and get someone like Alexander Rizak. You go and get someone of that ilk who can do what Werner does, but also finish and help hopefully take us on to, to the next level. Yeah, definitely. Um, Callum, do you 
echo that in terms of Timo Werner, or do you, do you agree with Callum that actually 50 million quid's cheap and we should spend the money on him? Well, I agree with myself, do I, mate? Do I agree with myself? <laughs> Sorry, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a little bit in both minds with this because I appreciate like what H is saying, 15 million quid, it's quite a cheap option for a squad player. Um, for me, age isn't on his side with uh and sort of style he's 28 i believe now 29 next year so you've got two older guard forwards in him and son um playing up there but i feel there are a number of players that are like Werner in the squad who are in the same sort of predicament i think there's people who can do a job but echoing like what Dave said, will they take us to the next level what we want? And that's the difficult part of it, because I think that Richarlison, Timo Werner, Kulazewski, Gio, oh, yeah, Solomon, um, Perisic, theoretically, when he was still our player, you had like six people there who are the same sort of producing figures with that sort of thing. You, they're never going to be... and they. It's wrong for anyone to compare them to Kane because you can't compare anyone to Kane, even Son. Then, even though they're in the same ballpark, they're not the same type of player. They're different, so it's unfair to say that about any of them. But I think that if you have someone like Werner in the squad to spread the goals around, I believe that's what Ange wants. He doesn't want the focal point to be one person, one person only in his squad. He wants mm. a squad of players who can compete. The problem is, is that, and I think Ange said it in these press conference this year, he doesn't want people just to come to Spurs because they're playing in the Champions League. He wants people to come to Spurs because they want to win stuff with Spurs. And I think that's the sort of mentality that Werner has, that he wants to be to be part of a team, not be an individual man. And a lot of Spurs fans are going to want that one person we re can rely on. Them days are gone for us now. And I I hate to say it because obviously I loved Kane. I grew up watching him, everything like that. But them days are gone. You've got to have these squad of players who can do it. And for 15 million as a squad option, yeah, you could say that you'd do it, but then you could theoretically go and buy someone like Jonathan Rowe from Norwich, who's having a great season for 20 million, just say, and he'd be the same sort of player. So it, it is really difficult. And if you do allocate 15 million, does that take it out of the budget for another player? Like Dave said, for an ISAC, do you have it as just bumper money for your wages? But the financial figures the club produced this week are bollocks anyway. So it doesn't really help our argument one way or another. Revenue, massive uh, turnover profits, or massive turnover increase, astronomical losses. So, and yet Daniel Levy still got his three million bumper payment. So it's all right. Yeah. Um, one of the things to um, talk about, actually, I know you've mentioned Isaac a couple of times, but I, there was something else I said somebody on Twitter this week as well. I think that that's something to think about, right? If you go out and you buy an Isaac, he's not going to play on the wing. He'll play through the middle, and then you've got Human Son who can play. On that side, instead of Timo Werner, when Timo Werner wouldn't even get anywhere near the you know the starting lineup if if Jun Min Son's played on the left, and you know you go out, what do you reckon? I'm plucking figures out of the sky, but sixty mil, seventy mil, you'd probably get you sacked from Newcastle from because they need the cash. Nah, nah, yeah. eight, eighty or ninety, they spent really on him already. I'd say. I mean, when you look at a similar player mm. to him, similar sort of age, um, Guy Carres from Sporting Lisbon. He's got a hundred million price tag. You're yeah. literally you're throwing the same sort of player together. Them two together, yeah, you're looking at hundred million probably around the ballpark that Newcastle would want. They're more likely to bin off. Um, oh, what's his name? Almiron or um, uh, is it Gim Gimaraes or something like oh, right. Bruno Gimaraes? Something yeah, Gimaraes. Like yeah, they're more likely to bin them off because they're quicker cash. And all that. I think Isak is mm. through and through the Newcastle front man. They're not going to get rid of him. I'd be, I'd be surprised. I think. Um, sorry, Dave, you were trying to speak, but you were a bit quiet in your end, so we didn't really get to hear you. But so I'll ask you quickly. Um, I think that, I think the figure that I've mentioned is is realistic. But I understand what you're saying, Callum. But because Newcastle need the cash, they, you know, for yeah. depends what actually depends what they do on FFP. Because if they do turn this all around and say actually it doesn't matter anymore how much you spend. When they're then, doing my revenues, yeah, that's the thing. You're going to be allowed to spend a certain amount on your transfers yeah. anyway. 
it won't matter because they're going to have all the Champions League money they got even by getting into the group stages this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I want to an- actually answer this quickly from Johnny because he said, and it's interesting, I think, he said, quick question, who's better, Timo Werner or Darwin Nunez? Um, he basically says Darwin Nunez is trash. Um, but <laughs> Harry, who's better? Well, listen, In term, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for experience, which I think this Spurs team needs at this moment in time, a very young team, very good team, but lacks experience to me. That's why I'm very keen to get Hoy beginning and around the team. The one's for you, Dave. Uh, and, you know, Werner does offer you that. But listen, Darwin Nunes, in terms of all-round play, if you put, he park his finishing, you know, his one-on-one finishing to a side. For me, his all-round play is significantly greater. Um, but in terms of we're looking like value for money, etc., then, you know, from club's point of view, in terms of the save money, Werner would be the right option, can play in more positions than Nunes can. So at this moment in time, I think Werner would suit Tottenham better. But overall package, you'd have to go with Darwin Nunes. Dave? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think I just spot on there, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, I don't hate Nunes as much as Liverpool fans, which is weird. No, I don't either. I don't think, I don't think he's that bad. You know, I, I think he's a young no. player coming to a new league, settling in, adjusting, getting used to his new team. Um, I just think, give him a bit of time. You know, he is young, he is a new league, and go from there. But, you know, in, in my opinion, for what Tottenham need, we need a Darwin Nunes. We need a, an out-and-out striker in my opinion, um, because, you know, as much yeah. as we love Sonny, I don't think he's been that great since he came back from the Asian Games. Yeah, he's scored a few goals, but he's not really been all that. Um, we are missing a Harry Kane. Yeah, I think, do you know what else I think we need is, is that we need somebody strong and tall, you know, and, and yeah. talking about the likes of Isak, Nunes, obviously, you know, someone like Nunes we're not going to get, but I mean, that type of player, you know, that, and I don't want to keep saying similar to Harry Kane, right, but that's essentially what, what it is, someone that's strong, yeah. At least six foot tall, I would imagine, and um, someone that can link up because we've got fast wingers. We then don't need necessarily a fast, you know, front man as well because the likes of Son Johnson, even potential, you know, um, Timo Werner can run in uh, behind as well. But Callum, um, Darwin Nunes or uh, Timo Werner? Um. Oh God. Um. Well, I I agree with Johnny's comment that Liverpool pretty much did get rinsed. Um. Uh, on the price tag by Benfica when they did get him. But no, I, I'm kind of like Dave. I I don't hate Nunez as much as um, Liverpool fans do either. I think he's got some qualities. He, he gets good figures. He's not, he's actually a good, he can hold up the ball quite well. He w- works well with Jota and Salah and people like that. So yeah, I, I think um, I'd probably take Nunez definitely if I could, because I think like, H said 15 million Werner is just a cheap option and it's definitely a Daniel Levy. Uh, yeah, that's Levy rub- it's literally a Levy signing rubbing his hands together. Don't get me wrong, I think Ange likes Werner, that's why he keeps playing him like more than say Dan Juma, Dan Juma last year for Conte. But I think Levy's rubbing his hands all the way to the bloody bank. I think this is a, this will be a clear signal. I think if we sign Timo Werner, then we know that it's a chairman signing in my opinion, because it makes sense financially. If we don't sign mm-hmm. Timo Werner, you know that Ange is actually getting away in, in what to do. Because as you say, it is exactly perfect to be in a Daniel Levy signing, like 100% written all over. Like everybody knows if we if that deal goes through, as you say, Daniel Levy is going, ah, oh, got an absolute bargain here. You know, I can't believe what a good deal I've done for myself. And, you know, we well, just know that that's not... Someone else, isn't he? That's what it is. Yeah. We sign, we sign Bernard, I don't need to sign anyone else. That that's the thing. Go, going on the back of what you said as well, Dave, it's quite interesting because usually around this sort of time you start seeing the transfer links and different bits like that. All the players that are being linked are either a left sided centre back as back up for Van der Ven or a, that number six role. There's no talk of strikers of uh, number tens, number nines, or your sort of pacey wingers. The only name that I've seen is Williams from I think it's Bill Bell, and literally oh, yeah. that's something that's just Spanish media because he's got 100 million price tag. You know, Levy's not going to yeah. do that. Andrew's already said he wants two 50 million players rather than a 100 million. So you tried to rob a... him off me when we were playing football manager the other day, didn't you, Callum? <laughs> oh, I've tried to kick him. We're not doing the best of both I... worlds if I have two 50 million players. 
I just deliberately did it to fuck you up, Luke. I just did it deliberately. I just kept looking at the media, just going, yeah, I'll buy this player. Nope, just whack his price tag up. What was it? I made you pay nearly 90 million for Jonathan David when you had a 30 million bid accepted. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> anyway, what were you saying, Dave? Sorry. I was going to say, if, um, if they're saying about Ange one or two 50 million players, does he, you know, if it's if he's on the forward line, then do both. Get Werner and get Isaac or someone like that, or Jonathan David, for example. You know, because you're going to spend 70 million on Isaac, 80 million on Isaac, 50 million on Werner. Technically, you've got 85 million in the kitty, but all this rubbish about a number six, you know, you know, today, today proved that, you know, we, we do need another one. I'll be honest. Consumers look horrendous in the last few oh. weeks. I don't know yeah. what's going on with him. You know, even Hoiberg came on at a better game than, than Basuma, but. Um, Clip I, I just, that. I, Clip I, that. I, yeah. I would hate this time of year because I hate the transfer window. It's when Daniel Levy does my head in the most, and that's when I become very opinionated. We all know that. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Um, we'll, we'll go on to talk about today's game, actually, um, after we've gone through um, the score predictions from the West Ham game. Um, we've kind of gone on to a tangent today. But just you know, keep everyone up to date, keep this uh, fun game going. For the West Ham game, I went for 3-1 Spurs. Winnie went for a 2-2 draw. Dave went for a 2-1 Spurs win, same as Callum. And Harry went for a 2-1 West Ham win, the Judas. Um, and the only person to get any points was Winnie, who got one point. And that did this to the table. Kept me on 29 points. Winnie went up to 24. Harry on 19. Dave on 18. Callum on 16. And when it's a double game week, you know, it means that there's a lot to play for, especially in terms of points. Um, so let's move on to today's game against Nottingham Forest. Um, Andrew Postacoglu decided to change one position in midfield, and that was to bring Saar in, um, which kind of made sense. You know, you, usually, like, he likes to play with Saar. You know, I would love to see one day him play Benzin Kors, Saar and Madison. Yeah, like so currently that's probably our best midfield three. Mm. Uh, but then, you know, as Dave said earlier, Dave, kind of hit between Benzin Kors and Basuma, they're battling it out to see you can have the worst time at the moment, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, Benzin Kors wasn't too bad when he came on today. Um, but he hasn't looked the same since his injury, which he's not going to yeah. for, for a little while. Basuma, since he's been back, has been bloody hopeless. And that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, but Star coming in today, I like Star, but I don't feel like that Star Basuma combination really works that well. It doesn't really doesn't doesn't gel at all. And you know, credit to Ange, half time we were struggling. I mean, I was going ballistic for half time. Um, but he made two changes: Ben Sankor and Hoybio come on, and it, it changed the game in effect because then we got control of that midfield. We kept the ball better. We started passing the ball better. But one thing I do want to bring up is. When are we going to have a conversation about Madison and his form? Mm. He's come back from injury. I don't know if he's scared to play or, you know, he's worried about his body breaking down or, but Lo Celso's looked better when he's come on than, than Madison has. Madison is just doesn't look like the same player before he got injured. And it, it worries me, but I don't know if it's because he's part of this leadership group that he's undroppable, but we're getting to a stage now where I'm thinking he's having no influence really on games. Passes are misplaced consistently, you know, and then you've got yeah. a couple of friends who actually look pretty good. You know, when, when do we have that conversation? Well, I think we need to start having it soon, to be honest, because, you know, you can give a player a little bit of time to, you know, come back from injury, to try and get settled back in. But all that James Madison did today was he was counting the number of fouls that um, Yates <laughs> made on him, and then he was telling the referee. Um, and then he nearly... Fucking punched him in the stomach for absolutely no reason at all. Like he, he just seems to like be t wasting too much of his time on other things that he shouldn't really be bothered about. Right? The referee's going to count many fouls he needs to get. Do you know what I mean? Like he shouldn't be getting into little scraps with people, no matter what they're saying to you. Seems like he's getting really frustrated, Harry, on the pitch, and it's showing in his performance as well. Even his passes are going astray, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They are, and in terms of. James Madison. I think that if I'm honest with you, I've been, I've been quite critical of him since he's come back uh, from injury. But I thought he was actually okay today. But he just didn't shoot. Yeah, I thought he got in good positions, really neat and tidy on the ball. When it really mattered, edge of the box and in the box, we're, we're passing backwards. 
I I'm, I don't want to sound negative here, but obviously the, the I think the first half you know against Forest today was was in two kind of halves is the way I like to look at it. First half of it exclude that because I thought we were really good, really sharp start, something we've been looking for for a long time, even sharper than probably we started against West Ham. But the second part of that half felt like we're going back to last year under Conte in terms of we get in a progressive position and you know, a goal scoring opportunity, but then we go backwards. And Madison was all, all this good move, but we go backwards. And there was, I counted at least five times where, you know, is a good chance at goal. And, you know, you hit it hard enough, the goalkeeper drops it and, and there's the likes of Werner and Son in around the box. It just seemed really simple to me. We're reluctant to shoot. And we've seen goals even this weekend, or no, sorry, last week with Liverpool, McAllister against Sheffield United, where that goal doesn't come unless McAllister takes a gamble and shot. Hoiberg, you know, wherever you think of him, and I know I've defended him a lot, Davis, you know, but he, he hasn't got the all-round package. We all know that. But he comes on and he sh- he's not afraid to shoot. And he does have the diagonal pass in him. And I look at this team and go, we just don't switch the play enough. I think Dave is absolutely spot on. Prasuma and Saar, you know, I wish they did work, but they don't. They, they, in a way, they're too similar for me. Uh, so that's not working. But again, credit where credit's due to Anne who, who changed it. And that's why we sit here discussing a win and not a loss or draw, which seemed like we could be discussing uh, around about half time, if not before. So, but Pers- Madison, the questions have to be asked. So, so do they have about Prasuma, Kulisevsky? So questions need to be asked for a few individuals. I don't like to throw individuals under the bus. I like to give them time. But if you're not, I'm also stand by the, my point. And I said it with Harry Kane when he had a couple of games that he didn't perform. You know, regardless of your status and history at the club and you know, the season you've had, if you're not performing, you can't be in the team. And if that's the case against Newcastle, Madison, Basuma, all dropped. Yeah, definitely. I'm you know, look, I'm gonna be the first to hold my hands up here. I thought that Hoiberg was absolutely sensational today. I thought that he came on and he controlled the game well. He didn't, you know, wasn't That's afraid to have a dodgy moment. Yeah, part of also that free <laughs> kick. I'm not sure why he decided well, that it was him that was on free kick duty. Well, for me, there's two moments. There's, there's one where, as you said, the main one, Forrest, and he let them back in the game. I think we had Gibbs White on the pitch, or, or Chris, in particular, Gibbs White, a little bit of calmness that goes in. So he got away with that. But there's also one that he put out of play at five seconds after. He has yeah. that, Dave, we can agree on this. That's his 30 seconds where he'd done that. Then he panics and he gets all, all hyped up. Then he, he misplaces the pass and he's going like that to everyone. I was like, mate, it's you. <laughs> You're going like that to everyone. It's you. You just put the ball to, out of play. <laughs> to be fair, to, you know, I'm like Dave. I'm very anti yeah, yeah. most of the time. I, I think that whole thing, though, um, it actually started even before Hoiberg. I, yeah, Hoiberg was yeah. a moron putting it out. But yeah, I yeah. think we already had a mad... 90 well, seconds he before them. It. he started it with the um when they ran, it was running back with him for the box if you don't remember and he played pass across the box yeah so that's uh, that's atrocious uh, pass yeah, but... you, you don't play it across your own goal line for a start you just you just don't nah. do that he, he started that whole thing and then 90 seconds later he passed out of play but but yeah. what i will say is i thought the whole game i thought the passing was poor i'm not gonna lie one thing that whether we've won yeah. lost or drawn this season i've gone our passing's been good and we've created opportunities I, I, even when we're winning, some of our passing was very questionable. It's basic stuff. You know, you want two touch passes, you know, from three, five yards out. So that is a bit disappointing. I think it's better in the second half with a new midfield. How bad was um, was Kulisevsky's passing as well? Like, I remember late on in the game, there was a break on and he was away on the left hand side. Yeah, and Dave yeah. Scarlett was pretty much free. And, and, you know, I don't condone betting at all, right? But I had a bet on for um, Brennan Johnson to score or assist anytime, right? But then when he gets subbed off, it goes on to the next player who happened to be Dane Scarlett. So okay. it's like the last minute of the game and I'm thinking, just pass it to Scarlett. Like, that's all we need. Tap it in. And it was just, oh, it's just dreadful, man. Like, I thought he was terrible when he came on. Because that's good. I think we, yeah, I think there's got to be, like we said earlier, there's got to be this conversation now where it's not, it's our whole midfield area, that whole free position in behind our front three now. It's Madison and the two behind them. Kulazewski's not in any shape or form doing anything. Madison's not doing anything. Lacelso's not even getting a look in, yet he looks the most likely to do anything out of them. And then you've got Saar, Basuma, Bentoncourt and Hoiberg. They're all not pulling their weight, apart from Hoiberg maybe for... 45 minutes today having an all right game all the rest of them they it's not even our front line that's been crap at the moment they're being devoid of any sort of creative creativity or 
easy passes. We try to do complex, overcomplicated stuff. We try and play around the box. We like the Johnny's the goal. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah just bloody. The the Van der Ven proved it today that when you shoot in the box, there's a chance to score. If that would have got the son or someone, he'd have tapped it between either foot, laid it off to someone to the side. He'd have tapped it between either foot and laid it back to him, you know. Nobody just seems to shoot anymore. I don't know what's going yeah. on. We, get the we don't. The box and it's like, it, it's, it is a difference between that natural goal scorer, I think, or has it been Anne just told them, no, you've got to play this style. You've got to create these opportunities and look for guaranteed spaces. That's that's a question that's got to be asked as well. And that's about the like what we said about the set piece coach earlier. That's about the attacking coaching stuff as well. And I don't know who coaches the attacking stuff for Spurs. It might be Chris Davis. It might be Matt Wells. I I don't care. We just need to be more clinical or at least take a bloody chance because we was create we was getting like 22, 25 shots earlier in the season. Yeah, I don't care if you have a load of shots. At least you're going to score a couple. Now our shot figures are right down. It, XG, I hate, but it does say something when half the time we're predicted to get 3.94 for all our hard work and we come away with... 0.9 something like that by the end of it all of this these stats are saying that there is a fundamental weakness throughout the middle of our team where people are just shy and they just try to do over complex stuff you're not like a Rodri you're not like a Kevin De Bruyne you're not a, a CDM like John Stones all these top class players just play don't try and be something special just play your game get on with it and try and score and I that's think the, the thing is, though, is that is that Andrew would rather them keep the ball moving to be able to pick out an opportunity than waste an opportunity. You know, keep the ball, keep the ball moving. But I also get your point, right? Which kind of moves us on to the next point is like somebody needs to take a shot, and who did take a shot? Fucking Mickey Van der Ven, and what yeah. a strike it was, um, Dave. Just how good is that from him? Like he's been absolutely sensational. Probably, I would say, without a shadow of a doubt, signing of the season for the whole Premier League. Um, he's a rock at the back, he's amazing for us, and then he pops up with an absolute thunderbolt. Oh, mate, he's so good, he's so he's honestly ridiculous. And I remember the talk, you know, I remember the talk before we signed yeah. him, it was him or Pat Sobo, wasn't it? You know, yeah, yeah, who do we go for, Pat Sobo or Van der Ven? And obviously, all our Tottenham fans were like, Oh, I'll get Pat Sober, but no, he's unbelievable. His pace is frightening, but he's so athletic for a guy his size as well. This is another thing where. You know, I wish he would score more from corners and things because he's a lump, big lad, you know. But that strike, I'll be honest with you, when he hit it, I thought I, my first words were, Who the fuck was that? You know, <laughs> I didn't even know it was him. And I was like, Jesus Christ, who the fuck was that? And I looked, I was like, Oh my God, it's Van Ven. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a thunderbolt. Keeper didn't even move, had no chance. And uh, yeah, you know, it was, it was great. And about dragon, dragon sitting there. I'm not, I'm not sold on dragon. Johnny likes uh, so what you've missed is drug. Johnny likes Dragashin because um, he's Romanian and so is Johnny. I think is where the connection uh, okay. is. So that's why he not, loves I'm him. not sold on Dragashin yet. I think he looks a bit sloppy at the moment, but that could be a you know, mm. adjustment. Uh, for me, we missed Van der Ven massively when he wasn't in the team, so, especially the way we play because he's got that pace, that recovery pace that. I've never ever seen from a from a centre half. I've never seen a centre half as quick as him. And he, he, you know, chews up the ground like he does. But when a player does get in behind, I'm like, that's all right, Van der Ven's it. Because I'm that confident that he's going to get there. But when Dragashin's in the team, he's not as quick, and it's a worry because of the way we play. And balls over the top. Fulham, prime example, cost us dearly. I think he needs to become a little bit more nasty. Do you know what I mean? Like, not, and I don't mean in a bad way, but I mean take away, take some of. Um, what Christian Romero has and then put it inside of Mickey van der Ven because he's such, from what I see, such a lovely guy. You know, everyone seems to get along well. There's a lot of laughing, joking. But like, there was a time against West Ham where he got bullied a little bit by, uh, he caught up with um, Antonio yeah. and then he kind of like, whether it was a slip or got shoved over, he's a big guy. Like, as you say, he needs to stand up in corners and, you know, push people out of the way and, and really dominate from that aspect. Shout out Romero as well, actually, because, you know, since he's taken up this leadership role, his bookings have just... Mm. You know, yeah. he's, um, he's done really well. There was one stupid moment here today um, when he was playing. I think there was three players, and it was Van der Ven, Hoiberg and Romero all going for it. The other two pussied out, so Romero had to take it. And the problem is, I think that... 
if Romero had of used his brain a little bit better, he'd have committed the foul earlier because it was very close to being on the edge, if not in the penalty area. So either you've got a dangerous free kick, like what Bentoncourt gave away the other day um, for a goal that was scored by Palace, or you've then got a penalty, which, you know, would have flipped the game right up in the air. And Forrest, even though they looked devoid of ideas, it was on the back of Romero being a bit lapsed where he should have just let it run through. Um, well, we touched upon that with referees actually as we're talking about it now. What do you all make of that red card that should have been a red card but wasn't a red card? It was a yellow card. But it's the same challenge, the same motion yeah. that Romero made. Chelsea, where he cleared the ball with his, his carried on that natural progression. For me, it's a yellow card, but we're going to talk consistency. Where's the consistency? Yeah. Oh, there's about yeah, as well, much fuck. There's about as much consistency as fuck all in the league this year. Because I mean, how many times have we literally said that we've only had one penalty since September or something like that? The amount of times that there's been calls for goals disallowed, VAR going against us, everything like that. I mean, it. The incident with Madison and Yates today. If Yates had have got the ref to go and get to have a look at the VAR monitor, then that would have been the most inconsistent bit. But then it, in the rule book, it says, if you tell the ref, look, go and have a look at the VAR, go and look at the VAR, you're meant to get a yellow card for that. So Yates yeah. should have got a yellow. Didn't, just got told, look, just, just calm down. Just just be quiet, all of that. There's, there's no consistency in the referee in this year. And I mean, how many times has the PMGOL had to come out and apologise for stuff? Uh, match of the day, ripping different bits apart. I don't think it's just us that are getting done on it, no. but there's no consistency whatsoever. And the refereeing standard this year and the latter half of last year has probably been the worst that I've seen in the Premier League for a long, long time, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's awful. And I, I definitely, you know, I'm mm. not one of these people that wears a tin tinfoil hat, right? I think that everybody gets mistakes against them. And everybody yeah. should just deal with the mistakes that they get, right? No one is getting more or less than anybody else. There's just consistency, inconsistency across the board. But that doesn't make any of it right. But Well, yeah. I agree yeah. with you. But where I will disagree is Wolves consistently get yeah. decisions against them. You can agree with any other team. But if you look at the amount of points that are taken off Wolves unfairly, I know there's a rule in terms of you can't block the goalkeeper. It has no impact yesterday on Fabianski getting to the ball because the ball's in the corner, he's in the middle of the goal, rooted to his spot. So therefore, for me, you know, you have you have to allow the goal. But there's nothing to say you you can't. It's whether the goalkeeper's going to get to the ball or not. So on is field, the player is the player stood in front of him, not not. Yeah. You know, if you look at it from a side angle, he's not full on level. So I think that's very harsh and Wolves, and that's the, denied them a point. Being honest with you, if Wolves got correct decisions this year, I think they'd find themselves quite easily inside the top six. So we consistently see bad decisions this year, and I don't like this thing that Spurs fans seem to generate. And they've done it all season. If this was Romero, it'd be a red card. No, it wouldn't. We've just seen inconsistent decisions. There's not, no bias against Tottenham, Romero, any other team. I think, I think Wolves have been on the unlucky side of some decisions, but I think they've seen bad. And Ryan Yates absolutely should have seen red. Salah should have seen red in the first fixture of the season against Man United for doing the exact thing, waving the red card. We just haven't seen it. So the referees, to, well, it doesn't help. I don't think they change some of it every year because it confuses more referees. But you need to sit down and review what's working and what's not. The same yesterday with the Ben White dive, you know, when he. Yeah, yeah like, we don't want to see that in the game. We just don't want to see that. Yellows for, for a dive, and I remember that. You know, it is just inconsistent with the board, but it's something that needs to be changed in the summer. What about yeah. Man United constantly getting penalties as well? But I think this has been a running theme since Bruno Fernandez came in. Um, I think how many games a year do they get a penalty in? Must be a running tally and a record. At the moment they've got like thirteen penalties this year. <laughs> oh no! I, They're so I could... irrelevant now that it doesn't matter, does it? They, they are irrelevant, but then the problem is, is whenever you get something come up with inconsistency in refereeing, they always get thrown in the hat and all that somewhere along the line. Someone always has to chip in, some United fan or a pundit, or you'll just get like Roy Keane say something. It's it's all <laughs> crap, but it's it is the whole point though that. The inconsistencies this year have been a, atrocious, and where where like H said, the, the rulings get changed every five minutes and all that. You've got either refs with egos 
refs who don't want to stand up to players, refs who are so far out of the game, they don't know what's going on, refs who favour top six teams, and maybe one or two decent refs. There's no clarity or consistency throughout it. And I think we're going to have this exact same conversation next year as well. Yeah, unless... I mean, we talk about it for bloody hours, can we? Referee, and, you know, it's one of those subjects that you're just never going to all agree on because um, officiating is too shocking. So it's definitely something that needs to be looked at moving forward. If Dave, if it was you, would you keep um, Stockley Park and VAR or would you get rid of it? Because I don't think he does fuck all for the game now. It takes the fun out of it now. I, 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 just to, obviously, I, I don't want to round on about this all night because it's one of them ones that you can talk about for hours. But what I will say is I would get rid of Stockley Park and I would change VAR to match the way the Europeans do it because it works a lot better in European countries than it does in this country. We decided yeah. to do it our own way and it's gone to shit, I'll be honest. You know, you don't see the same level of mistakes across Europe that you do in, in England. They're not discussed in VAR as much as we are. So, in, in my opinion, it's just a case of aligning with the rest of Europe, the rest of the football world, and all seeing it from the same hymn sheet, rather than us sitting there saying, no, we know better, we're going to do it better. Yeah, well said. Um, right, and the third goal today, going back to the game, because we still haven't finished that yet, um, <laughs> was scored by... Pedro Porro, um, again, a really, really good strike from a defender. And according to Leslie, that becomes our fifth, he becomes our 15th goal scorer in the league this season. So it just shows, um, you know, how many goals we're getting from other areas of the pitch that, you know, yes, we are missing certain Harry Kane, but uh, we are getting goals from all over the pitch, which is good to see. Anyway, um, that kind of wraps us up for today's game. But let's talk some score predictions because, as I said, double game week. So, all to play for. And the scores for today, I predicted 3-0. Winnie, Dave and Callum all predicted 3-1. And they got three points for a correct score. And Harry predicted 2-0 Spurs, which <laughs> it, me and him get one point. So, that does this to the leaderboard. With Winnie's four points this week, he managed to claw to within three points of me at the top of the league. So, I'm on 30. He's on 27. Dave's moved up to 21 ahead of Harry who's on 20, and Callum is catching Harry up on 19. No, Harry, stop. One, if it wasn't for the one point you got today, then uh, Callum would have been uh, level on points with you. Um, so it's all to play for. The other, let's not forget the other uh, league we're all in. That everyone's no, 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 no. Not that either. No. Well, let's talk about Newcastle, and then, before we end, we will talk about FPL. Hopefully Luke, hopefully Luke forgets. Because <laughs> they've no, already sent me a screenshot of the FPL league. Um, right, let's talk Newcastle because you know we go straight into another game next week away at Newcastle, Harry. The early kickoff on Saturday, the you know curse of all fixtures in my eyes. Um, uh, what do you make of what do you make of this? Do you think it's going to be tough? Newcastle are in you know up and down form this season, aren't they? They are, and you know, let's be real here. We're talking about a depleted Newcastle team in particular defensively without their goalkeeper or that key players. You, know, you look all over the pitch, <laughs> you know, Lascelles, Trippier, Botman, Pope. There's there's so many players missing from Newcastle. There's going to be goals in it both ends. You know, they bring a lot going forward still, um, you know, whether they have injuries or not. So it will be interesting. Am I looking forward to it? No. Do I think we'll get a result? No. Um but it is what it is. But no, we, we, we go there. We have to believe we can get something. I'd, I'd say it now. I'd, I'd probably take a point because um, I think it's harder and there is easier games for the end of the season. Uh, but that's, you know, we've beaten Forest. We've done what we expected. Um, we can go to James's Park and get a result. We're just going to have to be at our very best, deal with the pressure. We, let's be honest with you. The downfall of Stellini, if you like, in that very short period was the, the hostile atmosphere at James's Park. They came into it in good form. And it was, it was very loud, it was deafening, and we couldn't deal with it. And the game was done in 18 minutes. So, you know, I know this how far this Tottenham team's come. We've seen clear evidence of it. Like now, we've t you know t um, equaled our points tally of last season. We're still seven games remaining. That is clear signs of, of progress for you right there. But I want to see how far you know, that mentality's shifted and can we deal with the hostile atmosphere. Big test will be Anfield. Big, te big test will be St. James's Park. Dave said there about you know, the battering uh, for the end of the season. Uh, Fulham was one. I still think we do one before the end of the season. Um, and I think it could be either Newcastle or Liverpool. Uh, but, you know, trying to not be negative, we have a chance with the players at Newcastle have got out. We just have to play it right, 
get the team selection right, impact the game right, and exploit Newcastle defensively. You know, shoot more, more crosses, you know, defence set pieces. We have a chance, honestly. We need to go there believing. Yeah, no, I, I, I do agree. Um, do agree with you, mate. I think that we need to be more ruthless, especially early on uh, in games as well. Dave, what do you think about uh, Newcastle away? Tough game. I hate playing Newcastle away. It's a um, horrible, horrible fixture. And, mm. you know, yeah, they are in up and down form, but they, they're a team that score goals. You know, and that, that's a worry for me with our leaky defence. So, <laughs> going to be a, an interesting game because they're also a team that concede a lot of goals. So, you could be on, the, you know, a 4 all here. <laughs> you know, it's got, it's got the size of one of them sort of games. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, to be honest, I'm just looking to see where we finish at the end of the season, see how much we've improved, uh, and then kind of go from there. I'm trying to remain positive this season, but we've got a tough four weeks ahead of us. Yeah. 100%. Look, I think as far as fixtures go, Callum, you know, this is kind of like the easiest of the fixtures that we've got coming up. And so we really have to make, you know, charge of this. Look, where we sit currently, fourth in the Premier League on goal difference. We've got a game in hand, which happens to be Man City, over um, Aston Villa. So realistically, top four is in our hands, right? We can talk about potentially fifth being good enough, et cetera, et cetera. Realistically, finish fourth you get Champions League football next season. The Newcastle game, is it a must win? I would say so. I think we've got to win this because you only based on the other fixtures that we've got around us, um, because Villa have an easier run in towards the end of the season, to be honest now, compared yeah. to ours. We've still got to play City, Arsenal, Liverpool, Chelsea. No matter how many crap results Chelsea get, you know we're still going to end up doing something stupid against them and all that. They'll get a result against us. We may do City. Arsenal, I'm afraid of at the moment. Liverpool, hit and miss. But Newcastle, we've had two crap fixtures there in the last 10 years where we've conceded 11 goals in two games and all that. It's ridiculous. And we've got to win it. it our force in our hands. We have to control it, not let Villa pick us apart or rely on our... We can't rely on Villa mistakes. We need to control it. And if we screw it up, then it's our problem for it. What does annoy me, though, is that it seems that everyone bloody beat Fulham since we lost <laughs> against them and all that. Everyone got a result against Fulham apart from us. No offence, Barney. But <laughs> so we are probably better than every team you've played since we played you and all that, and yet we got trounced big time. So it shows that anyone can beat anyone in this poxy league. Mm. Um, quick yes or no. Um, I want to go around the houses um, about Newcastle because we've got to wrap up. But Dave, I'll start with you. Do you think that Eddie Howe's time at Newcastle is coming to an end? Do you think he's taking Newcastle in this new era as far as he can? Absolute rubbish. Um, <laughs> I mean... From the highs of last season to this season, it's a big, big drop. But they have had massive injury problems. You know, they, they have a really depleted squad. So I think it's coming to that time. I think if they don't get European football this year, he's gone. Um, because, the you know, with the money they've got and the backing they've got now, they, they won't tolerate that from going to the Champions League to nothing at all. Um, but, yeah, I, I wouldn't like to to write him off just yet, but I kind of feel like we, we are getting to that point. Yeah. No, the reason why I asked is I, I've got, I've got a very yes. good, I've, I've got a very good, you know, inkling. I think that, I, I think he's limited in terms of where he can take this Newcastle team. Um, but, you know, who do they go for? You know, it wouldn't surprise me if the Saudis don't try and bring in Jose Mourinho or somebody like that to Newcastle to try and, um, you know, add that name to their brand and their, um, empire they're trying to build at Newcastle but Callum you're shaking your head and huffing and puffing and blowing the house down what are you, what are you talking about? Well one Mourinho why the hell would you want his name on anywhere anywhere near anyone and all yeah. that if the Saudis did that then they're delusional and the Geordie fans would kill them I think literally no matter how much money they pump into the club they wouldn't want a Mourinho and two I think Eddie Howe's a good manager I would if he did leave Newcastle England have to snap him up. Simple as that to replace Southgate. But Spot on. The, pro the problem is, though, when you've got 
someone like Eddie Howe, who has struggled with all these injuries, it's not on him. It's the players that he has got in the squad not pulling their weight to do something else. And I, I think he's a good manager. I actually wanted him before we got bloody Nuno and all that at um, Spurs. I would have taken him hands down as someone like that. He was offered yeah. He was offered to Celtic and then uh, he turned it down last minute and now he's gone to Newcastle. I think that's his, that's where he's that's where he's at. Bournemouth, Celtic, Newcastle role, that's kind of his limits to me. I don't think he's going to win anyone in the Premier League. He... <laughs> Great. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't... Harry, right. really short and sweet. Yeah. What I think you I, I think you disrespected Eddie Howe, if I'm totally honest with you. I think what he'd Good. done with Bournemouth <laughs> That was deliberate. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think it's fair, and I'm going to put you. Know, so for me, it's very simple when it comes to Newcastle United, and Dave's already touched on it. Depleted squad, lots of injuries. I think it's what it's expected. Yeah, maybe not the start of the season, but in terms of Champions League, trying to juggle it all, they're very unlucky. Play very well in it. They absolutely robbed at PSG with the decision. They should be through. We, we should be talking about Newcastle right now in the Champions League. I think they had, they had a good chance of really progressing in that, and they had a really really tough group as well. So everything has been against Newcastle this year. Eddie Howe's given debuts for like as Lewis Miley. Paid, you know, turned out to be a good decision. Uh, and the fact for me they're even in a European fight is, is impressive considering the players they've had out. I think Eddie Howe is the manager. I think he will win uh, titles, whether that be at Newcastle or not. I think being the manager next season. I think for me, next England manager after Gareth Southgate, as Callum said, absolutely. Him and Gary O'Neill for me would, would be in contention. Um, so I think you, you owe Eddie Howe an apology and I think he, he will pay you back for Saturday and you, you will regret it. I think he's a top manager and you know, as Callum said, I really wanted Eddie Howe at Tottenham and I don't think that's stupid and I don't regret that whatsoever. I think he's a, he's a class manager and what he done at Bournemouth mustn't be underestimated. Turn them into a tiny club. Yeah, you know, you know, let's, let's face it, really tiny club in the Football League and took them right uh, to the Premier League. So, didn't need I say anymore. Sweet, Harry. Yeah, fair enough. As, um, as always. And, yeah, and that, basically, no, I'm not going to apologise to Eddie Howe. Because A, you're never <laughs> going to see this, and B, I couldn't give two shits. Um, right, let's move on. Score predictions against Newcastle. Harry Scarf, I'm coming to you first. 3 2 Newcastle. We're not getting anything. Oh, God. 3 2 Newcastle. Another Judas. I've planned out all my predictions from now to the end of the season. Have you? Well, yeah, all done. Um, Dave, I'll come to you next. 3 3 draw. 3 3, I think you said. 3 3 draw. <laughs> I don't know. He's Mike's in his ass, so uh, we might work it out. He's in a pool, isn't he? Um, Callum. <laughs> um, three, two, Spurs. Oof. Oof. Bold. Three, two, Spurs. I like Don't you dare overtake me. <laughs> well, put, Sorry, put you on. down the bottom where you belong, H. Put you down. <laughs> Who's at the bottom of the FPL league? All right, and I'm going to go uh, for Not me, a... Thomas still is. <laughs> True. I'm going to go for a 2-1 Spurs win. Uh, we've yet to get um winning score prediction, but as soon as we get it, um, I'll add it to the list as well. Right, really quickly, let's talk about FPL. Um, bear no, with thanks. me. <laughs> so, Dave, um, looks like you are top of the league again. I don't think, I think last week um, you were. I thought it was a huge majority. Point. I thought the, the uh, was 40 someone, points behind. Uh, someone took over for about an hour. <laughs> yeah, Dave's back at the top, 1,823 points. One Santo That's right, it's actually a bit more than that now, mate, because uh, the, the other scores have been added, so. 1,796, because, um, yeah, according to my app, it hasn't updated. Um, no. Then it comes to me in sixth on 1,731. Oh, my God. I'm only 60 points off second. I'm, I'm fighting for top four in this league. Uh, <laughs> and then we've got Winnie in tenth on 1,651. So what's that? He's 80, falling. Point, 80 points behind me probably now. Jesus uh, Christ, that's a big drop. Yeah. Mm. And then Harry Scott, <laughs> 1,510 <laughs> points. That's an even bigger drop. Yeah, so, but again, I, I got told I spent 310 points on transfers this season. That's just that's just well, coming in. That, that's points, that's yeah. astounding. Uh, wait, how many points? How many points are you behind, Dave? Let's have a look. Too many. You're, All right, you don't need to 300, lose, 310 points basically behind Dave. So you'd have been <laughs> top of the league if you hadn't spent all those points. <laughs> oh, no. oh yeah, there you go. Oh, Great. And then uh, <laughs> Callum is 16th on 1,355, and then Thomas is last. Wait. Thomas could join. Um, after the about half, you should catch season. him up. Don't worry. Um, 
So yeah, big up to Dave, still going. We need to potentially think of a forfeit for Callum for being bottom of the uh, FPL league. But well, um, to be fair, Callum joined uh, two weeks after it started. Uh, don't give an excuse. So then that goes to Harry then. Yeah, it will go to Harry. Yes, <laughs> yes. Go on, Twitch to H, Twitch to H. What, No, no, what, what you do is you, you take out, the way to work it out will be how if Callum joined two weeks into the season, you work out his average points per of the season, which I can do at the end of the season, and then you add it to his total for average weekly points. And if it's more than Harry, then Harry does it before. If it's less, then I don't think it will be. <laughs> perfect, perfect. If you have any thoughts, um, let us know. Yeah. Well. Be kind. Um, yeah. Right. Uh Johnny has said agree with Harry again. Three two to Newcastle. Barney mm-hmm. has gone two two. Barney Did you get one? I said three three. Yeah, forty two points in FPL this wow. week. Um right, that kind of wraps us all up for this week's show. I really do appreciate everyone that's come on from uh Spurs Kings TV. Thanks for all of you for tuning in. Don't yeah. forget to hit the subscribe button and everything else. Uh appreciate everybody else for coming on, you know, this late. Um, it's been you know a really good show, but Dave, thanks for coming on again. Uh, how can everyone find you? Um, on Twitter at Park Lane Pod Dave, um, or on the Park Lane Pod Twitter account. Um, I'll always reply to you if there. If you've got any comments or questions or anything like that, then hit me up. Perfect. And Callum, how can everyone find you? Thanks for having me on, as always, mate. It's uh, at Callum Stubbs ninety seven on Twitter, and yeah, hopefully going for a Spurs win next weekend. Amazing. Brilliant. And Harry, how can everyone find you? Yeah, thank you very much for having me once again. Uh, big up to Spurs Kings DB. Do a show there every Friday. Follow me there, Harry Scarf 22 and my channel, uh, Scarfy Spurs Talk. So, yeah, go check that out. Thank you very much for having me. No problem at all. And uh, once again, thank you to our sponsors at Manscaped. If you are interested in what Manscaped have to sell or want to buy anything, head over to manscaped.com and use the code PARKLANE20. That's PARKLANE20 for 20% off plus free shipping. Thank you guys once again for everybody to tune into this show. Um, you guys are what make this show uh, what it is. So really, really appreciate every single one of you. Um, keep tuning in to us. We'll be back Tuesday night to do some more um, pro clubs. Last week we went unbeaten until our last game. Uh, so we won five games out of six. So it was pretty good. The chemistry is flowing and the banter is also good. So head over to us on YouTube, 8pm. Um, on Tuesday this week, and then we'll be back 7 p.m. next Sunday for more Part Lane podcast. Apart from that, thank you all very, very much. Have a great week and a massive come on, you Spurs! Up the Spurs! Oh,